preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming once again. Our guest this evening is Dr. Sherwin Newland, who's a clinical professor of surgery at Yale and teaches, among other things, I believe, medical history and bioethics. He's the author of the award-winning How We Die, as well as a biography of Leonardo da Vinci. Lost in America is a memoir of a relationship between a son and his father. But more than that, I guess, an attempt to come to terms not only with your father, but also with yourself. I was thinking, you know, who among us has not at one point or another said to himself or herself, I'm beginning to sound an awful lot like my mother, or an awful lot like my father. And in fact, the first realization I think usually comes with a bit of a shock and, and is perhaps even distasteful when we're very young. But as we age, um, I think we become more tolerant of our parents and hopefully of ourselves as well. In your book, uh, which takes you through your early childhood to mid or late 20s, would you say? This process of identification is brought into sharper relief um, because you begin by recounting a very long episode in your life of acute depression. And you describe yourself in a stance as stooped and physically incapacitated as was your father. Were you, in fact, identifying with him? Only Dr. Freud knows, and he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were an acute depression. It was, it was really a severe chronic depression which reached an acute phase, uh, so acute that I was hospitalized. And of course, I was hospitalized for a long time. I was hospitalized for more than a year. And the young resident psychiatrist who was assigned to my case, because his name was up on the list, actually saved my life because he made an ultimate decision about treatment that was directly contradictory to what the great Mahatmas wanted to do there. You don't mind if I ramble. Please. Oh. That's why you're here. Well, you know, I came to this place after a couple of years of just getting more and more despondent and finally not being able to work and being admitted to an acute care facility in my own hospital, the Yale New Haven Hospital. That, that didn't work. So my brother and I decided that we're going to do this for real, and I was admitted to a large private hospital in Hartford, the Institute of Living. Some people here may know it, which at that time was at the top of its form. And no matter what they did, no matter what medications they tried, psychotherapy they tried, just nothing worked. And I was getting worse and worse and worse. And they had one of their conferences, one of their patient conferences, these great professors of psychiatry. And they decided that the only way to get rid of what was by then severe obsessional thinking, I was paralyzed by obsessional thinking about everything you can possibly imagine, including her. Religion had a lot to do with it, uh, in fact. They decided in their wisdom that they would suggest a kind of treatment that had, had been all but abandoned by that time. The year was 1973, toward the end of 73 but was still being done there because one of its pioneers was in the hospital right across the street, the Hartford Hospital, a neurosurgeon by the name of Scoville. They recommended that I undergo, get this, a lobotomy. Well, this young resident said, absolutely not. This will, of course, destroy this man. And there was this back and forth and forth and back. And he was a young man, as I put it in the book, highly thought of in that place. And he threatened to resign if they did this. And so they said, OK, just to humor you, buddy, we will embark on a course of electroshock therapy, which they did. And it took 20 shock treatments 
But this is all by way of answering your question, <laughs> which is that this young fellow, who was actually the product of the very medical school I'm going to lecture in next week in Rome, said that he felt, once he had gotten to know me over the months, that that very first day he saw me, I was indeed my father. My father had a crippling spinal illness that had left him with a scarred cord. He had lost a sensation that all of us had called proprioception, which enables you to know where your arms are, where your legs are. You lift a spoon, you put it in your mouth, you touch your finger to your nose. You don't have to look at that. And the result was that he shuffled when he walked and he had a certain posture that was an inimitable posture. Only he walked, uh, stood that way and walked that way. And Vittorio, who later, of course, became a great friend of mine, I even referred to him as my brother, said to me, as I say later, that, my God, you were your father. There is no question. Everything about you, including the way you spoke, not with that thick Bessarabian accent. Well, it wasn't a Bessarabian accent. It was an Italian and Jewish accent. Can you imagine such a thing? Mel Brooks once said that his mother had an Irish accent. And one day he figured it out. All the cops were Irish. And to her, you know, they were the authority figures. So when she came here from Valutte or wherever she came from, she tried to imitate their accent. My father worked, as so many of our parents did, in the garment industry on 7th Avenue, 37th Street, whatever. And half the people were Italian and half the people were Jewish. I cannot do his accent. I try to put it on paper, but it's unsuccessful because there is this Italian stuff in it. Well, I wasn't talking that way, but I was doing just about everything else like my father. Yeah, I had become him. And you said, um, I mean, you mentioned Freud before, and, and, and you, in your description of him, you, you conjure it up with all the antagonism, I guess, of, of the Freudian relationship. You say, I am in his grip still. Um, do you see your relationship with your father in Freudian terms? I see everything in Freudian terms. Do you? <laughs> yeah. You know, one, I'm not a believer in Soros. I'm not one of those people who thinks that if it doesn't kill you, it strengthens you. My son is always telling me this, but I just don't believe it. I think everybody should avoid Unglick as much as possible and have a nice, peaceful, tranquil life. But I did learn a lot from this. It transformed me. And one of the things I learned, because essentially I had to learn it, was an enormous respect for psychoanalytic theory. And the result is that I really do think of everything in so-called Freudian, whatever that means. And, and I, I think in terms of the unconscious. I think in terms of being formed by childhood and our parents and our siblings and the continuity of uh, Door of a door, generation after generation. Yeah, yeah. You describe your father at one point as unnatural because of his, I guess, explosive temper, his moodiness, his hypersensitivity, and perhaps most of all because of his neediness and his reliance on you. Um, is that why? You found it unnatural. You were a young child, and he seemed to both physically and psychologically lean on you? Well, it was his powerlessness that gave him his strength. Uh, that word unnatural is used because much of that book is written through the ears, the eyes, and the mind of a child. Mm -hmm. What I did was to essentially emotionally reconstruct how things felt. That's the way I've always written. Uh, you know, I don't plan anything I ever write. I'm working on a long essay of 7,000 words right now, and I have no idea what I'm going to write tomorrow. I will read what I wrote today and just pick up from there, and that's how that book was written. That's how How We Die was written. I find that if I can bring back the emotional memory of what something felt like, 
everything follows from that. And you know, this is the century of the brain, and we have discovered that there is such a thing as emotional memory. We even know where it's housed in the brain, in a little place called the amygdala, and we know that it's associative. We know that if part of an emotion comes to you, the rest of it will come, and then it will become connected to the reality of time and place and people, and soon the whole thing is constructed. And I find, as now a writer, oh my God, I hope that's not for me. No, I'm afraid no? that's mine. I <laughs> oh. apologize. Well, I can go on by myself. Please, You've given me a good start. Do. I'll just yeah. take a moment to turn it I just off. find that the words come from that emotion. They, they essentially allow themselves out onto the page. And I have an extraordinary piece of technology that is always very helpful to me, and this is it. Has a little software, and this one's a little worn down. Has a little software on the end. Uh, I just sit down at uh, a particular kind of pad. I have to have paper with very narrow lines. Those of you who went to Hebrew school remember the machberes, or now they call it the machberet, or something like that. We had very thin lines and wide lines in between. And I have to write on that kind of paper. I write on every other line. And at first, when I first started writing, when I started writing How We Die in 1987, the only place you could get such paper was at board meetings of the Yale China Association. <laughs> so I scrupulously went to every board meeting, and at the end, I would go around the table and take everybody's pad. I ended up being chairman of that committee. I, I ended up, too, going to China 10 times. But I got that paper, <laughs> and, it, and it was worth books. And finally, of course, Staples now sells it, so I don't have to do that anymore. But I think one of the reasons I write that way is that it brings me back to something inside. And it, it's like a Ouija board. Remember those old Ouija boards? It takes you somewhere, and you don't know why it's taking you there. But with the writing, it always seems to be the right place. Well, you recall several incidents um, of your father's inappropriate behavior. And I, I guess there's one in particular which must have been quite painful. Um, you describe it at length, painful for you as an adolescent, and it takes place in a subway, um, and he is being taunted by these Irish girls, and you refer to it as his public humiliation and mine. Um, now, if the portrait of your father is not idealized, I dare say that neither is yours. Um, there's another incident in which uh, your father begs you to go to the movies with him. And you get all the way there. He's seeking distraction from um, unemployment. He's cooped up in the house all day. And um, he says, Shep, take me to the movies. And you go with him and reluctantly, and once you get there, you realize that you've seen the film before, and you dig your heels in, and you say you will not see it again. And there's this adolescent solipsism, and there's almost a, a kind of a spite and a revenge. Now, it's interesting, you know, to me, what you said just before about the emotional memory, because clearly that's what you are evoking here. Um, I think it must have been, you know, and I, I'm reluctant to talk about this because I think it must be a very, very painful memory, and yet because you write about it, I guess we do need to talk about it, but you don't justify yourself and you don't wallow in guilt, and I, I, I think that it's kind of a sober, almost detached depiction that must have been very hard for you to, to share with all of us. I've been uh, living with that episode since my 20s when I looked back on it and realized what I had done, because until that time I hadn't. Here was my father who could barely walk in snow, and there was snow all over the ground. I think it was January or December, and cooped up he was. It was one of those long periods of what was called the slack season, the slack season, as he would call it, for the garment industry. and. Uh, 
he it was a Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon and he wanted to see this movie. He didn't know what the movie was, neither did I, but there was always something new playing at the Oxford Theater on 183rd Street and Jerome Avenue and he said, let's go. It took us a long time to make our way through these three or four blocks down to the theater and we got in sight of the marquee, I realized I had seen this picture. And yes, I dug in my heels and I wouldn't go. And he begged me, he actually begged me. Uh, there, there were tears in his voice, not in his eyes, but in his voice. And I refused. Now we've all, almost all of us have had 14 year old boys and girls. We know what they can be like, but this was 14, this was adolescence in spades. This was, yes, it was revenge. This was all of the anger of recent events because there were always recent events to be angry about and all the determination not to give in and I have this strange memory. I see things in pictures, and it's photographic in that sense. There are conversations I might not remember, but I see events exactly as they happen. Uh, so much so, I was at the New York Historical Society two years ago, and I asked for a map. I just happened to be there by accident doing something else, and I asked for a map of the area I lived in when I was three years old, which I actually describe in the mm -hmm. book. And it's a big street map, and every house is on that map. We moved out of there when I was three. My entire recollection of that is exactly the way it was. So that's the way I remember things. And my memory is he and I turning ourselves around step by step by step till we were facing back toward our house and then making our way up that snowy street again. You know, I have told that story to every one of my four children out of a sense of guilt. They, uh, they make fun of me for it whenever there's a little tightness between father and children. One of them will pull it out and, and say something about it. But I felt I had to put that in the book because it really was symbolic of my relationship with my father and the little things that I would do to get back at him. You know? Yeah, that word unnatural was the way I saw him as a child and as an adolescent, he was different. He was not of this world or he was not of the world of other fathers. But you know, despite the resentment that you depict, the resentment of this very young boy in, in this memoir, you also share moments of very great tenderness. I mean, the, the, the scene when he teaches you how to shave, for example. And I think even more moving, I found, was the tubs and tubs of chocolate pudding that he would put up whenever you came home from school. Um, and, and you said this was a constraining and unthinkably bizarre form of unspoken love. Well, like so many people, so many fathers and sons and mothers and daughters, we never said, I love you. It just was not something that we, that we did. I always knew my father loved me. I always somehow knew that in spite of the rages, in spite of the fury, in spite of the unnatural behavior, in spite of what seemed like distance, I always knew it. And it wasn't even a question of sensing it. He just had no way of expressing it, didn't know how to do it, and was awkward and clumsy in every attempt that he made. And so tenderness was expressed in something like him awkwardly teaching me how to shave in front of that bathroom mirror in 2314 Morris Avenue, which I invaded two years ago. I got on the D train, I came down from New Haven, I walked over to 6th Avenue, got on the D train, got off at the 182nd Street station, and I went to my old PS, and I went to the Fordham branch of the public library, and I went to 2314 Morris Avenue, and I knocked on the door of apartment A, and Mrs. Valdez let me in. <laughs> and it was quite wonderful. That apartment was not one half the size that I expected it to be. It was one third the size. How seven of us lived in those four little rooms is beyond me. 
I'd like to come back to his neediness, um, which apparently also came from his inability to adapt to life in America, hence the title of your book, Lost in America. Um, in fact, your whole family, it struck me, seemed to have had a great deal of difficulty making that adjustment. <laughs> they were here for a very long time. Um, you know, and I was trying to understand the internal dynamics of the family um, and whether they in particular made it more difficult than for perhaps other immigrants of the, of the era. Um, your grandmother was this very strong, charismatic, almost matriarchal force. Um, and, um, well, for the extended family, but also for all these landslides, they used to come and visit. Do you think that her presence helped or hindered the process? Well, let's talk about the process and the environment a little bit. The wonderful Ruth Gay wrote a book about six or seven years ago called Unfinished People. She also grew up in the Bronx. Ruth called her book Unfinished People. And what she meant by that was that entire generation, actually there were several generations, came to this country anywhere from their early teens to their late teens some a little younger, some a little older, never really fully educated or acclimated to what they were in, quote, the old country, in dead haim, as I call it in the book, and never really acclimated to what they found here. She thinks of them as unfinished. And they were, as I look back on it now, they were a generation of adolescents. They needed us, they needed their children. We're seeing it now with the Asian immigrants, that their kids are the bridge between them and the world. Uh, even if they speak English, it's not good English. They don't understand the institutions. Uh, a lot, with the Chinese, the orthography of their language, even if they could read and write Chinese is so different. And for a lot of these people, it was Yiddish. Now, fortunately, there was a Yiddish press, and you may remember the health department had signs in Yiddish in the various clinics, Yiddish, Italian, and English. All the signs were at that time. But nevertheless, it was a very difficult and foreign in every sense, alienating place. Now, so many people went to night school and learned some things, certainly learned the language and got them started reading. Some of them somehow managed never to do that. And my father was among those, and my mother was among those. Everybody in the family was among those. My grandmother, this four foot, eight inch little woman, you know that old joke, you know you're Jewish if you're taller than your grandmother when you're seven years old. <laughs> yeah. uh, she was, maybe, maybe she was 4'10 if she put her umbrella up. Never learned to speak a word of English at all, but was an extraordinarily powerful force. And one of the problems, as you know from reading the book in our family, was that my grandmother did not talk to my father. There was something that had happened years before that I've never gotten to the bottom of. So there was this all this strain. Uh, my, this, my foreign father in the midst of the other kind of foreign mother, of my mother's family were all blonde and blue-eyed, all had this optimistic sense about themselves. My father had very dark hair and very dark brown eyes. And as I describe it uh, in the book, there always seemed as though there were a very thin tear layer on his eyes. Uh, he was seeing the world through a certain kind of pain and a certain kind of wistfulness, I think, that I never understood until I was much older, when it was almost too late. And do you now? Oh, that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book to find him. It's an amazing thing. We all try to find our parents, even though if we don't realize we're trying to find them. That's what I meant, and you alluded to this. I was trying to find my father and in the process find myself, and I think that's a journey we all want to take. Uh, find out who they really were, see them as people, not as these authoritative, powerful, or sometimes completely impotent, or sometimes both at once 
people, but see them as human beings with all of the problems that ordinary human beings face, added to which was the problem of having a nasty little kid like me in the family. <laughs> So in America, Meyer Noodleman was a man with no past, you write. He was a man with no past. He had cut himself off when he left this little town, Novoselitz in Bessarabia, and never communicated with his family again. Um, yet, you know, I wondered, uh, his ruthlessness seemed to be perhaps one of the sources of his mental instability. But you and your brother um, changed the Noodleman name to Newland with his blessing. That's right. And in fact, <laughs> you know, there's this other part where he wants to join you in that change and you don't want him to. And um, But what I really want to talk about is the change. The change of last names for us, I think, um, implies a kind of a rejection of the past. It was a rejection, of, it was a rejection of my father. There was no question about that. One associates one's name with one's father, even among Jews where your last name has probably only been there for three mm -hmm. generations, unlike it is in other societies, that our shame, and we always, both of us, felt extraordinary shame about my father's condition, about certain aspects of his behavior. Our shame made us want to separate ourselves. The change of name was a manifestation of that. Actually, that name change had been done by other members of the mm -hmm. family uh, about two decades before. Mm -hmm. They had invented this name, Newland. Who would have thought of it? But they did. So my cousin Saul Noodleman invented it, and he became Saul Newland. But at that time, I was beginning to think about medical school. Medical school has always been hard to get into, but in the 40s, the opportunity for a Jewish boy who went to a school like NYU, which was 80% Jewish at that time, to go to medical school was not spectacular. And we used to pull all kinds of stratagems. Uh, I'm going to ramble again. You know, they weren't supposed to ask you what your religion or background was, so they, but they could tell by your name. They had other ways. Every medical school application asked your mother's maiden name and your father's occupation. Well, there are Jewish occupations, especially for people who come from New York. So we figured if they're going to play games with us, we're going to play games with them. So my friend Irwin, whose father sold fish livers at the Fulton Fish Market, wrote that his father was a viscerologist. <laughs> My friend Ronnie said, whose father was a house painter, said that his father was an interior decorator. <laughs> but what I'm getting at is we used to, Jewish kids from the Bronx who went to NYU or City College would apply to 25 or 35 medical schools. And a lot of those boys, although they were excellent students, never went to medical school, never got into medical school. I was obviously one of the lucky ones. Uh, a lot of it had to do with back-breaking labor during those four years, just an insistence that I was going to do it, so I did it. Yeah. Well, for some people, of course, religion works as a link to the past. Um, and in a sense, I think it did for your father, although you condemned um, his mechanical, thoughtless form of observance. Your grandmother, you say, had a much more personal and perhaps even spiritual relationship uh, with God. Um, did you think or do you think that that is more desirable, admirable, enviable, perhaps? Verves. I, I have absolutely no idea. You know, as you're asking me these questions, I'm thinking, well, many years ago, I heard a talk by Abba Eba. And he said, I will entertain questions. And there were many good questions. And then finally, there came an insuperable obstacle of a question. And he said, you know, he said, I, I said I would take questions, but I didn't say I would answer them. <laughs> I'm trying to get out of this because I have no idea how to, how to okay, approach let, that. Let, let, yeah. let's, let, let's say something else. You, you mentioned before, and I think you certainly do in your book, that for you, religion seems associated with obsessional thinking. Oh, yeah. Um, and at that you, time. At that time. 
you felt that way at that time. Um, and you point especially to the um, Untane Tokef prayer, which is about the role of repentance in averting a severe divine decree, as an example. And you say you feared the seductive power of theology. So right. can I ask you to explain that instead well, of... Well, the seductive power the of theology was really this atavistic, this throwback belief that God knew everything and that God indeed did punish bad deeds and bad thoughts. So what it ends up being is obsessional thinking, and it was obsessional thinking of that sort that was such a powerful factor in my decline into depression and the worsening of my depression during those years. In fact, I'm convinced, well, nobody knows why electroshock therapy works. I've you know, tried to study it, tried to understand, nobody really knows. It's a cascade of so-called neurotransmitters, these chemicals that carry the messages from one nerve ending to another. But one thing we do know about it is it, it obliterates memory. And it obliterates memory usually for a short time and for some people for a very long time. What it did for me was it stopped the obsessional thinking because after a while I couldn't even remember to obsess. I couldn't remember what I was obsessing about. And lo and behold, the old me came back. The old self-assured me came back because I could no longer make those connections, which were automatic. Their automicity disappeared, and it was over. That's the physiological explanation. That's the physiological explanation. You have a better one? <laughs> no, I was hoping that you might help us. No, here Dr. Somewhere Freud else. eludes me. Well, I, I do want to mention that your first bout with depression <clears throat> occurred in adolescence, and it was associated with fears of homosexuality. Yeah, I had, you know, uh, kids... All males have sexual identity problems. We didn't talk to each other. You know, boys talk to each other nowadays about their fears. Everybody knows that everybody else masturbates. Our generation, everybody thought he was the only one in the world who did such a thing. So there were these enormous guilt feelings and enormous feelings of confusion about sexual identity. And as part of my obsessionalism, I said, gee, I, I, well, we didn't use the word gay in those days. I, I must be a homosexual. I must be. It's the only way to explain my feelings of inadequacy. Because, of course, at that time, one associated the gay mentality with a non-masculine mentality, with someone who couldn't cope with the world. So as I saw myself as a, as a weakling, I decided out of the clear blue for no reason that I was this thing that I had just discovered the year before. I was 14 when I discovered that there's such a thing as a homosexual. I was working in a uh, men's store on Fifth Avenue called Finchley's. And I used to go home every evening with this wonderful guy that I really liked, whose name was Buddy, who uh, pomaded his face and did his eyes. And one day, one of the workers began joking with me about Buddy being, well, he used one of those derogatory terms for gay men. And I said, what is that? He said, well, you know, they, may I use a dirty word? Please. They fuck other men. And I said, that's impossible. Here I was, 14, never heard of such a, it's impossible. He said, yeah, yeah, that's what he is. So the following year when I had my depression, that's what I focused on. I must be like Buddy, because I'm really not much. I'm really worthless. And when I had my later depression in my late 30s, those thoughts weren't really paramount in my thinking, but they would, they would come around. Here I was by that time. I had two children. I'd been chasing women like crazy when I was single. Didn't make any difference. That was still there that I could torture myself with. Yeah. So I really wasn't even interested in talking about your homosexuality, but talking about... See, you the never know what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> but talking about the fact that um, this crisis was connected with your abandoning of your morning prayers. I want to come back to religion. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I, I teach literature, so I look for all of these interesting hidden sure. motivations. 
And I saw two ways of looking at this shift, and I'm going to go out on a limb, and you can pick one or tell me that both of them are ridiculous. Okay? Number one, the first was that, and this is really not very deep, the approach of your doctor um, was so helpful, and of course it was a rational one, and so you decided that because that was rational, it necessarily precluded that of religion and its, its seductive power. Its seductive me and my doctor theology. when I was 15? Right, yeah. right. The second, he said take cold showers. Right. It's right. a very manly thing to do. Right. And, and you were afraid that if you took the time to say your morning prayers, the effect of the cold showers would wear off. Yeah, if you take a cold shower and then put on your tallest and fill in, you're going to lose all the power of the shower. It's a lot of magical thinking here, my dear. Right. right. <laughs> so I stopped davening. Yeah. But, but the other thing that I thought would make for a very interesting um, literary metaphor, if you like, was that in asserting your, your sexual identity, your self-control, your power, you were able to overcome your fear of your father. You could reject the authority of your father, and therefore you could reject the authority of the father as well. I didn't reject the authority of the father until I had my breakdown at 39. I was a, I lived in many ways, although we didn't have a kosher home and that had to do with the mentality of the woman I married, uh, we lived in, a, in an essentially orthodox household because I was afraid of hellfire. And it was when I got sick and I came out of it that I was able to face the fact that all of my religious, I don't want to offend anyone here, but I'm sure I will, that all of my religious belief, not religious belief, but my religious belief was obsessional thinking, and it didn't have to do with true faith. But it left me with a very interesting <laughs> phenomenon in my life. I became a complete agnostic but I can't stay away from shul. I go to shul every Saturday. I love to daven. I'm the biggest shuckler in the place. Everybody knows I'm an agnostic because I don't hide it. But I've discovered an interesting thing. That our, our conservative shul is full of agnostics. It's full of people who shuckle and sing real loud and don't really believe. They just love to be there. They love to be among Jews. They love to identify as Jews and let everybody know about it. And you know, here, let's get to Freud again. Freud said that one's religious belief really has to do with identification with one's father. And now I can be in shul with my father. He's been dead for 45 years, but, I can, but my father is always with me when I'm in shul. It's very interesting watching my own. I have two sons. Uh, I can see it influencing them. It's me that they are with in shul. They're physically with me in shul when they come to shul with me, but there's something very emotional about that connection. <coughs> You're staring at me <laughs> with a baleful look. No, no, not baleful. I'm trying to understand. <laughs> I'm not sure I do. No, you don't. No one has to understand because these are emotional things. And it's very fine to try to look for intellectual understanding. But you just have to be satisfied to be at peace with certain things. You have to be at peace with your Mishagas. And once I realized that, life became very, very easy for me. I realized when I got out of that hospital at the age of 43, 30 years ago, because I'm almost 74 now, when I got out of that hospital at 43, I knew that I would always be a little nuts. And I thought, well, that's fine. I understand that, and, and certain things stay with me, and I'm just going to live with them and enjoy this wonderful life that I've been given back and all the privileges and opportunities that I've had. And there have been no recurrences? Uh, a couple of times I've sort of felt this thing coming back. It's a sensation that I recognize. So I call my old friend, Vittorio Ferrero, who grew up from being that resident, and we meet and talk and talk and talk. It's been twice now. And uh, lo and behold, it goes away. 
Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, your family experienced uh, quite a few illnesses and deaths. Um, your own diphtheria, which uh, brought you into early contact with which with what was then the state of the art, I guess. Um, and it sounds pretty horrible. Um, your brother's rheumatic fever and uh, the treatment, which you know you are clearly uh, critical of, uh, followed by the death of your mother, and then appears on the scene this wonderful woman nurse by the name of Esther, I think, who the the respect and and, and the fondness um, with which you recall her. Um, makes it clear, I think, that she brought you a lot of comfort and also that perhaps she was one of your early experiences with the medical profession that was very positive. The other was a cousin, was it? My uh, cousin Willie. Willie. Yeah, my Newland. cousin Willie, yeah. Um, so I guess he was an early role model, was he? Well, you know, my mother died a week after my 11th birthday, but she had been sick for about five years. She had uh, rectal cancer, refused surgery, because it would have meant a colostomy. And so there were many times she would be admitted to the hospital. It was a hospital called Beth David up here on the east side. It's long since gone. And there were other times when there would be a crisis. And when there was a crisis, whether she fainted or some other really drastic thing occurred, someone would rush down to the corner drugstore and put a nickel in the slot and call Cousin Willie, who was a general practitioner mm -hmm. in the Bronx, and he would be there within 15 minutes. And I must tell you that the mere appearance of that man on the door, at the door of our little apartment, converted a scene of panic and chaos and fear to something that was serene, because we all knew that Willie could take care of things. That so long as Willie was there, there would be no acute tragedy. And that was the image that I had of my cousin Willie, who of course treated us for nothing, and that was the image I had of what a doctor can be. In fact, when I decided to go to medical school, the whole idea was to have an office on the in the building on the corner of 183rd Street and Morris Avenue, mm -hmm. you know. Of course, I never did that because I got fascinated by technology and became a surgeon like so many other young people. You know, become, they go to medical school for the most idealistic of reasons and then they're entrapped by the intellectual aspects mm -hmm. of it and technological mm -hmm. aspects of it, you know. Well, I'd just like to read a few lines from the book. Um, you said, I had by then realized that my interests in biology were not strong enough that I could envision a career spent in laboratories. I was Boba's grandson. Life meant people and their endlessly fascinating ways. And it also meant sickness and death. At 17 or 18, the image conjured up by the thought of disease was not one of organ pathology, but that of an exhausted, fearful human being with a name and a face and a family distraught with apprehension and woe. The image also included a doctor who could enter a small apartment and merely by having stepped across the threshold bring calm to a scene of confusion and dread. The doctor of my mind's eye was assured and eminently capable. He walked in an aura of certainty. When he entered a room, all anxiety would be vanquished, every danger would be manageable, his very presence would foretell the fulfillment of hope. Um, this is certainly an ideal, I think, for, for all of us. Um, now, after a lifetime of experience, is this still an ideal? Have you encountered people like that? Is it, is it a reality? I tried to live my medical life so that every morning when I woke up and looked myself in the mirror, I would see that man. That was always my ideal. Even during the worst of times, I tried to be that man. Yeah. Do you think that the role of the doctor has changed over a generation? Huh. 
how many cases of beer do you have that we can sit and drink and talk about that? That that's of course it's changed enormously. And in, in, when I first began practice, it was possible for a highly specialized person, a surgeon or a cardiologist or whatever, to be a doctor like that, and it's uh, close to impossible today, for lots of reasons. Lots of reasons, you know, which I guess we can't really reasons. go into. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, recently you wrote a piece in the New Republic um, about an exhibit at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which is entitled Deadly Medicine, Creating the Master Race, um, in which you examine the balance, delicate balance, I guess, between science and, and ethics. Uh, perhaps one should say the seduction of science, and in particular eugenics. So I'd like to quote a little bit from this, and then perhaps you could address it for us. Especially in medicine and medical research, the atmosphere not only is not detached, but it is in fact largely the product of the very influences from which its participants seek to free themselves in order to isolate observations and conclusions from external sources and subjectivity. Though we would have it otherwise, I've skipped a bit, though we would have it otherwise, there is no such thing as a thoroughly detached scientific undertaking. The danger in this lies not so much in its truth, but in the inability of society and the community of scientists to recognize the pervading influence of such an unpalatable reality, which flies in the face of the claims that form the groundwork for our worship of the scientific enterprise. Um, you quote the, a definition of eugenics as the science of the improvement of the human race by better breeding. And then um, this is an issue that you've also addressed in an article, I think, in the New York Review of Books. And of course, there's all this politicization of stem cell research. And here we are on the eve of a very hotly contested election. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, these lines that, that I've pulled out, or any other aspect of this that you discuss in this piece? How should we be thinking about this topic? Well, I think it's important for everyone, scientist, physician, layperson, general reader, as, as we call virtually everyone else, to understand that the nature of science is not objective and distanced. It's impossible to do the most basic experiment without a point of view. I've never known a scientist who didn't have in his or her mind some notion of the way they wanted it to turn out. Uh, one of the great virtues of having spent so much time studying the history of medicine is the recognition that in the past this has always been so with medical discoveries, that, that there, again, is no such thing as detached interpretation of what we see. There's a personal agenda, there's a scientific agenda, there's a, a social agenda. There are many agendas that come together that make us interpret what we find. And if that were not so, I couldn't stand here and say truthfully to you that in, let's see, I graduated in 1955, 50 years, that I have not seen, that I have seen so many, many swings of the pendulum back and forth, the kinds of diet for specific illnesses that I was, was taught had to be given are exactly the opposite, for example, of what I was taught. The treatment of breast cancer, a disease that I saw so much of in my practice, is so very, very different than it was. In fact, it's diametrically different than it was. It was originally, in my early days of surgery, the most radical thing you can do, because that's the only way to expunge the disease, and you know what's happened to it today. As, as you watch the, the debate range back and forth about hormone replacement therapy for women, you wonder why it is that opinions are so different uh, every two years or five years, and it all has to do with interpretation of the same evidence, just different ways of interpreting it. And those ways are dependent on how the interpreters need to see it at that given time. There is a specialty called philosopher of science, and to them this is just second nature. They just assume it from observing medical and other scientists throughout their careers. What are some of the forces you think that are operating now or the most, the most um, well, I don't know if pernicious is the right word, but 
but certainly the strongest forces that are operating in this in this area. Well, the strongest force that will always operate and has always operated is careerism. That every scientist is trying to get ahead. The years of greatest scientific productivity are the years between, let's say, 25 and 40. That's when you're bucking for professor. Uh, these days, with research funds at a premium, the NIH is, is financing, what, about 25% of the people who apply to them. There's enormous competition for research funds from every source. And so you've got to look good. You've got to have positive results. You've got to confirm, perhaps, what other scientists have been finding. You can't be an oddball anymore. So I think careerism is the major thing. Uh, Political factors, of course, have always been present. They have never been as present as they are in this country at this time with this particular administration. Uh, areas of research, and you referred to one of them, stem cell research, that would have just been pro forma to continue with have been stopped cold. Not only have they been stopped cold, but they have been stopped cold in the most interesting, circuitous way. The president says, well, you know, this is an ethical thing. Should we use these embryos? And but So I will choose a bioethics committee. So one would think, that's wonderful. He'll get objective support or suggestions from an ethics committee. Well, there are ethics committees, and there are ethics committees. He chooses the most conservative bioethicist in this country, maybe in the world, to be the chair of that ethics committee. So he's going to get the response that he wants. So there's a political agenda at the present time, too. I'm sure there's always a bit of a political agenda, but it's never been like this. You, you said, I think, if I understood you correctly, that at one time this would have just gone on automatically, the stem, stem cell research. That research, right, it would have flowed from the interest and the curiosity and the careerism of the scientists, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and what accounts for the reason that it was stopped, you say, is purely political? I mean, it's... Well, we have an administration that caters to a group that used to be known as the moral majority, the far right, call it what you will, who actually believe, and one has to respect this belief, that aborting anything conceived, even if it's simply a, a sperm that's just entered an egg, that aborting that is a violation of God's precepts. Well, they believe that, uh, but they also believe that it is uh, appropriate to dictate what other people do with their beliefs. So we're in a situation where religious beliefs of individuals and of large groups are determining national policy for people who don't share those beliefs. Would you like to join us? Any questions? Comments? Sir? I'm a great admirer of Dr. Newman's work, and I've I must ask you, how is it possible to write all those books and maintain your, your practice as a surgeon? How did you find the time to write? <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't. I wrote my first big book, Doctors, in 1988 while in surgical practice. And it was easy to do that because surgeons aren't like internists. Internists start working early in the morning and they just keep working all day long. Surgeons have delays in the operating room. They have emergencies and throw everything into a cocked hat and there may be an hour free or whatever in the day. So I would rush over to the library and do that. But when I started writing How We Die, I took a year's leave of absence because I felt that a subject as emotionally tinged as that. How could I justify taking care of sick people while working on such a book? So I took a year's leave of absence. And the very first morning of the very first day, I've been working for about two and a half hours. The phone hadn't rung. It was very quiet. My wife was home at that time, and I walked in the kitchen. I said, you know, I really like this life. <laughs> After 30 years in operating rooms, which I had always loved, but 30 years is a long time. So we, it was January 2nd and, uh, of that year, uh, 1992. So we said, well, we'll talk about it 
for the rest of this year and make up our minds. And it was Rosh Hashanah afternoon. We were going for our Rosh Hashanah afternoon walk when we decided I wasn't going to go back to clinical work. So I still teach, obviously, and teach courses and teach in other people's courses, but I don't do clinical work anymore. As a follow-up, the incentive for a successful surgeon to write these books, the incentive to, to do the doctors and how we live and how we die. The incentive is that it's inside and it has to come out. This book, you know, this book wrote itself. This book had been bursting out of me for years. My publisher didn't want it. My agent didn't want it. My editor didn't want it. They kept saying, everybody writes memoirs. Why are you going to clutter up the world with another memoir? And then they said, you know, you have a genre which is explaining medical things to a general reader. Your readers expect you to write in that genre. So finally I said, ah, oh, the hell with all this. I'll write it. And I don't care if you take it or not. So they did. And the advance, you know, they always give you an advance when you write a book. It was one third my previous advance, but I just didn't care. I had to do this. We're glad you did. Thank you. Yes. Oh, getting back to your father, when you discovered what the true diagnosis was of what all that horror in that man created, what was your epiphany at that point, and how did it relate to your ultimately coming to terms with the man? Yeah, um, let me tell those who haven't read the book what happened. I was sitting in my dorm room in my first year in medical school. I had no idea what was wrong with my father. In fact, I always suspected that it was a little psychosomatic, that he was using it, that it wasn't all real. We never had a diagnosis. So I'm sitting there reading my physiology book, and I'm reading and reading and reading, and they're describing a particular disease. God, this is exactly my father. Every single symptom, every single sign, every single physical finding they were describing in this text was my father. And, uh, you know, you get kind of bored late at night. And I hadn't even looked to see the heading of, of that section. And I hadn't looked to see what that disease was that I was reading about. So I looked up and it said Tabes dorsalis in the subheading. So I went to the main heading and it said syphilis. That's what he had. And suddenly, yes, it was an epiphany. It was as though, I think the way I put it in the book is, it was as though I was hit between the eyes with a mallet or, or something. That All of a sudden, I understood something I had never understood before, that he couldn't help it, that he couldn't help it. And it was still a very long way to go, or else I never would have had to write this book 40 years after he died or 45 years after he died. But it, that made a huge difference to me. And if there ever was such a thing as an epiphany, it, it was that moment in that cold dormitory room on a late November night. Now, interestingly, you turned to Willie, yeah. who, of course, had always known it, yeah. had never told your father never or told anybody. anybody, anyone, yeah. um, you know, which which brings me back to the question that I asked about how, how medicine, the practice of medicine had changed over the generation. I mean, this was, I think, kind of common practice yeah. not to tell the patient oh, yeah. or the patient's family. Yeah. Was that a wise thing, do you think? I mean, in, in, in retrospect, what, what do you think is... I don't know. I have to tell you that my sister-in-law and my nephew and my niece, when they read that book, told me that they were very angry with me for never telling my brother, that they felt that it was a dismissal of him. But I thought I was protecting him. Because that's the way we thought in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, now we talk in terms of the bioethics. We, we talk about patient autonomy, which is so important. And we didn't give people autonomy at that time. Doctor knows best. I was the doctor. It was a secret that I had and he didn't need to know it, and I was protecting him. That was the philosophy that we lived by then. And what is your position today? Well, you know, I 
was one of the founding members of the Bioethics Committee of the Yale New Haven Hospital in 1986, and I'm, uh, I serve on the Executive Committee of the Yale Bioethics Forum. You can imagine what my position is. My position is very clearly that you don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I read your book. I bought several copies for friends. I loved it. Now you mentioned your brother. What was his reaction to the book when it was published? My brother had died long before the book was published. It was his children and his widow who were so angry with me over not telling him. You know? Yes. Um, one of the more touching moments, of many touching moments, was the description of your father when he would come home with great eagerness to see the brother who died. That he, it, it sounded as if he were somewhat speaking as a Freudian, <laughs> um, how do you sort of look back, you sort of allude to it, but don't yeah. go into great detail of how much of a disappointment that was and how much you may have held back for fear that something might happen to you or your brother? Well, it's, it's an interesting notion. Um, what's being referred to is that there was a little boy who died at the age of three before I was born, and I had always felt that a big part of my father went down into the grave with that boy, and he was never the same after that, that it just ripped something out of his heart. And he seems to have, from what I've heard, have been demonst you know, demonstrative with that child, whereas he could never be demonstrative with my brother or me. My brother was born about a year and a half after that child died, and I was born three or four years later. Yeah. You're suggesting, I think, that he was protecting himself, perhaps, yes, in, I mean, in his love? In, in some ways, that it would be so, to have to repeat that grief with yet another child. Yeah. You may remember that when my brother had rheumatic fever and there was a question after some time of what the future would hold, my father later telling me that if the news was bad, he was just considering doing away with himself. He couldn't deal with that another time. Yes. Your father's emotional outbursts, is that in any way related to the syphilis, or is that just part of his personality who he was? Yeah, he had no, um, his brain was not involved at all. He just had this spinal cord manifestation. There is, as you're alluding to, uh, cerebral or brain manifestations of syphilis. There was apparently never any evidence of that at all. Yeah. Yes, sir. Did you ever worry, worry that your depression was going to come back when you wrote Lost in America or when you talked about it? You bet. Uh, <clears throat> one, when you've been as depressed as that and been through all of that, you spend the rest of your life wondering, is it ever going to come back? <clears throat> and when I was getting ready to write this book, or this book was getting ready to write itself, as I said, I had no choice. Uh, I was aware of the possibility that <coughs> those emotions would come back to me. I was aware of that danger, but again, I had no choice about writing it. And of, and of course, not only did it not happen, but when it was over, People say, did you get a catharsis? Well, I don't know what a catharsis is. You know, I know what a cathartic is, but I don't know what a, cathar <laughs> what a catharsis is. I felt as if I understood some things that I hadn't understood before, that that journey that began the night in my room when I realized he had syphilis had reached a much later phase. Of course, it's a journey you never complete. You were trying to understand one another. We're trying to understand our fathers, ourselves. You can never do that completely. But I felt as if the journey had begun at that time, and in writing this book, I had taken a very long series of steps on that journey. Yes? Did you make any conscious efforts to be a very different parent? 
<laughs> well, you know, there's a, there's a line in the book that, that says, I have spent my life trying to be the un-him, trying to be the opposite of what he was. And I've raised all my children using my father as an example of what not to do. But I must tell you this story. So I have these four kids. Huh? I bet they say there are things about you that you don't even recognize. You're, you're, you're stealing my thunder. You hit it right on the head. <laughs> what happened was that when the book was in manuscript, my wife gave it to uh, my younger boy, who's the third of these kids. And uh, he read it. And when it was over, she said, well, well, uh, what do you think of it? And he said, you know, it's interesting. Dad had some of the same kind of problems with his father that I have with him. <laughs> so. As a follow-up to that, though, is it different raising the daughter then? I'm well, I'm, you know, I'm so besotted with my daughters, as so many fathers are, that, you know, my wife is always pointing out that either one of them can just wrap me around her finger anytime she wants to. I, actually, I just met my younger daughter outside to hand her this month's rent for her apartment. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe on that note, we, uh, well, well, I guess not. Are there, were there any books that you uh, have read about sons raising their Yeah, you know, it's funny, when I was going to write this book, uh, my editor, who finally gave in when he knew he couldn't keep me from doing it, sent me uh, Roth's Patrimony. And I found nothing in it that I identified with, but I'll tell you what I did identify with, a book I read in the 1960s when it was reissued, and you'll know what it is. It was Henry Roth's Call It Sleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that father had certain characteristics that reminded me so much of my own father. And actually reading that book gave me the courage to write mine in the dialect when mm -hmm. I was trying mm -hmm. to uh, describe how my father spoke to write in dialect. And also the, the independence of that little boy reminded me of my independence when I was very young. So yes, mm -hmm. that one book. Yes. Um, I was reading a book on tea. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Well, you know, I found this is this is something I'd, I'd like to tell you about. I found tape. I've always taped my own books. I just enjoy doing it, and they always ask me to do it, so I do it. And this one, obviously, who was going to be able to do that accent? I found that very, very difficult doing that taping. I, you sit in a small room, glass enclosed. There's an engineer and a director out there. And I would just get choked up every couple of pages and have to, to this day, if I have to do a public reading of certain parts of this, even though I may have done it 50 times before, there are certain places where I just have to stop and choke up. So I'm going to beg off doing that because it, it does make me a little too emotional. Uh, it reached the point where the engine, the uh, director knew before I did when something was happening, and he would just stop me, and we'd quit for five minutes and, and go back to it. Yeah. You know. Yes. It's very interesting that uh, I have a nephew, my brother's son. My brother didn't talk, apparently, very much about his family at all. But when he talked about his father, it was with nothing less than hatred. My nephew thinks that my father was the meanest man in the world, the coldest, hardest man in the world. My children although they never met my father, love him. My older boy 
has as his middle name, Meyer, it's his Yiddish name, Meir. He just had a son seven weeks ago, and he gave him Meyer as his middle name, specifically because of my father. So here are these two boys, one of whom had to go through hellfire, but nevertheless was able to understand and resolve what this was all about, and the other of whom had to build up a barrier to protect himself. You know, so I crashed, he never did. But his image of my father was so different from what mine ended up being. And I don't think that's so different from what happens in many families. You know, one of the things that I learned, and I've said this so many times, is that the more personal you get in your writing, the more intimate you, you are, the more universal you are. You know, I get lots of letters, especially about this book. And I get letters from people named McCarthy and whatever who say, you know, my father wasn't like yours, but there are a hell of a lot of things where he was. My agent's wife is a Chinese American. And when she read the manuscript, she said, God, you're writing about my father. So. Um, in your book, it was, and I, I think tonight too, it, it was clear that your you felt that your depression was tied in with your relationship with your father and that, you know, somehow you had to, at least this is what I thought, that you had to just get the book out in order to deal with the depression. And yet you are a doctor and so much of the medical view of mental illness now has to do with physiological and chemical causes. And so I just... I'm wondering whether I even have it right, but how do you reconcile that? Well, I'll respond to you in Yiddish. Ihalt nicht von solche Sachen. I don't believe that. I honestly do believe, and as you can imagine, I've spent an awful lot of time thinking about this and reading about this and studying it, that the physiological and biochemical accompaniments of mental disease, not in all mental diseases, like schizophrenia, for example, which is almost certainly has an organic background, but the ordinary uh, neurotic, obsessional, de most depressive diseases, the biochemical accompaniments are accompaniments, that the primary thing has to do with errors and thought processes, with emotional bases to what become physiological and organic changes. And that has to be true because now that we have PET scans where you can see oxygen and, and so-called functional MRIs where you can see oxygen uptake and activity in the brain, it can be demonstrated that emotional states do indeed change the organic composition of the brain. So this is my viewpoint. Who knows 50 years from now what we're going to know. But the mere fact that you can treat depression with a particular drug that allows the, the, the non-depressing pharmacological agent, the neurotransmitter, to, to go where it's supposed to go, only means that you can treat that symptom. That, to my mind, is not the basic reason that the depression started in the first place. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.